<clears throat> and you are live. Action, as they say. Come. All right, folks. Uh, as uh, when we left here last week, uh, Harry asked uh, one of the most important questions uh, that anybody could ever ask uh, during the dispensation of the grace of God. Uh, he said that he knew that Jesus was a Jew. So Harry wanted to know why he's coming to the Bible study, how he fit into all that. And that's what we've been doing here the last two months of how uh, you being a non-Jew, being a Gentile over here, no hope of God in the world, fits in to over here with the people under the covenants of promise, the children of promise. We're going to go ahead and turn, uh, being as he said that, to Ephesians 1.13. And then uh, we've got a couple of things we're going to talk about prior, uh, before we get to where we left off last week. Uh, we started out with 1 Timothy 2 right here. Uh, the board is full here again today. What we are going to do, uh, go ahead and turn to Ephesians 1.13. But the board right here is full of stuff that we didn't get last week. We're going to talk about the all again and then the many that are that was in Christ earthly ministry. And uh, you only find many in Romans 5 uh, because it wasn't too all at that time. So uh, Ephesians 1.13, this is how we today fit into that and if you do not understand this you don't know where you're at and whom ye the ye's here are these gentiles uh, that had no hope of god in the world aliens from the covenants of promise you there is no way in the world that you could have any hope of god in the world unless you bless israel according to these covenants over here here you have uh, genesis 12 you had to bless israel to be blessed and you had, if you did not, you were cursed. God would destroy you. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. He made a promise to Abram at this time, and he meant business. You're going to look at uh, Goliath. What happened to him? He got a stone right between the eyes and crushed his skull. You can look at Jericho. It fell. But the lying whore that helped Israel right there did bless Israel. Her house stood while the walls of Jericho fell down around it. So, and you can look in uh, numerous places, uh, Acts 10, how the uh, Cornelius blessed Israel, gave alms to Israel. And in doing so, his blessing was that Peter went to preach to him, and then all his household was saved. So anyway, uh, Ephesians 1.13, in whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, not the gospel of our salvation back here during Paul's Acts ministry. Your salvation, this is how you fit in. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We talked about that in the last week or so, about what that promise is. And that promise is, is righteousness, eternal life. And that is the and that hope of eternal life, you lay hold on to that. And that hope uh, of eternal life is not a, well, I hope so or whatever. It is a biblical hope is, I know what's going to happen. I just don't know when. But you do have eternal life once you've trusted the gospel that Christ died for. Your sins was buried and raised the third day for your justification. Just as if I've never sinned. That's how you put that. So we're going to come back over here. There's a couple things not on the board here tonight, but we did start last week with Acts 26. And it is right here. I squeeze it in right here. We're going to look at a couple of things because I had an old boy uh, comment this week. And, uh, and he wanted to come off with all this hogwash about uh, Acts 2.38. And I'm going to tell you straight up front. And I, it doesn't bother me to say this. If I'm unfeeling, if I don't feel, if I don't sound uh, like I care or something, I really don't, to be honest with you. Uh, these religious folks, that's all they do is they want to pound you, pound you, pound you with Acts 238. You can talk to them till you're blue in the face and they will not listen no matter what. They do not understand what remission of sins are and forgiveness of sins. I'm going to talk remission. Uh, last year, uh, a lot of credit card companies, when the, I don't even want to say it, the bid came around, uh, they would... Uh, for three or four or five months, and they didn't mind that way. I called them and said, hey, I, I didn't get to work three months last year when I was supposed to start. And what credit card companies would do, you call them and you ask them, say, they would postpone any payments for four or five, six months. 
interest would accrue on that. So what that basically was, was it was a remission. It was pushed forward, okay? And that's exactly how the sins for Peter and the boys and the little flock was, is pushed forward until the second coming of Christ. If you trust the gospel today, you have forgiveness of sins right now, and you have eternal life. That's the gospel of your salvation. It wasn't the gospel of Peter's salvation. So anyway, Acts 26, 18, we went through this, I believe, last week to start up, or it could have been on the intro to Timothy two weeks ago, I believe it was. And this is Paul's third in the book of Acts, his testimony uh, about his conversion on the road to Damascus. And this is what the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is telling him right then. In 18, to open their eyes, that is the, the people and the Gentiles in verse 17, and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, not the remission of sins, forgiveness. And inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith, that is in, in me. Now let's turn to 2 Corinthians. And you're going to see what Paul in 2 Corinthians is saying about the same individual that is keeping people blinded today, 2 Corinthians 4. <clears throat> and this is probably the last book that is wrote in the uh, uh, prior to uh, for, on the hope of Israel because Paul doesn't mention the Jews anymore. Uh, so it's probably written the same time frame, Acts 20 and verse 3 as uh, Romans, but it's probably written after that. Paul is no longer mentioning Jews. He knows what's going on, uh, but he's warning also people we're going to look at in a minute, like this old boy with Acts 2, 238. We're going to talk about him right here in a minute. He's a minister of Satan, and Paul says that specifically what he is. And his works, he will pay for those works. But in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3, but if our gospel be hid, what is the gospel of Paul talking about right here? Our. Well, he's talking to the Corinthians, of course. He's already gave it to them once, but we're going to look at that right now. First Corinthians 15. If I'm going too fast, would you let me know? <clears throat> Say, hey, hey, hey. First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the our gospel in 2 Corinthians that Paul says Satan is blinding the people so they can't believe this gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye, the Corinthians, have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Paul says there and says, by which you are also saved. You cannot find anywhere where Peter's telling you that you're going to be saved by believing that gospel. He doesn't say that. He doesn't tell in Acts 2, 38 that you're going to be saved by that. He just says, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Why? If you look at verse 22 and 36 of Acts 2, you'll see to whom he was speaking to, the nation of Israel. He's not speaking to you. So get your head out of the sand and read Acts 2, 22 and 36. See who he is speaking to. And you can't find yourself in those verses. And then he says, for the remission of sins, not the forgiveness of sins. Why did they have to repent? Because they just crucified their Messiah. If they would change their mind about crucifying their Messiah, he's not your Messiah. You're nowhere, nowhere in the Old Testament. It's Israel's Messiah. He, if you are trust the gospel of the grace of God, is your head, the body of Christ. Okay? And verse 3. For I declared unto you, first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and then he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now back to 2 Corinthians 4, Paul writes to these same Corinthians after he just beat them all in the first letter because they were very carnal. They were doing things that were unimaginable, well, in secret today, but this is widespread back then. Anyway, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 3, but if our gospel, that same gospel I just read to you, be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If you do not know that gospel and you're saved by that gospel, you're lost. You're doomed. You're going to perish. No eternal life for you. You're dead. There's either, there's two things that's important to God. You either have life or you have death. 
And we're going to talk about that tonight here in a minute after I uh, go through a couple of things. We're going to get right back to where we were last week. God's will. This is God's will is that all men be saved in this dispensation. Here, it was many. And as soon as I read a few other verses right here, we're going to get to these many right here and see what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John says about you. And you do not fit into that many. And in verse 4, and whom the God of this world. If you are lost, your God is not Jesus Christ, and it is not God. It is Satan. People don't like to hear that, but that's just the way it is. You worship Satan by not believing that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. It says it right there. And the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. If you don't believe the gospel, Satan has blinded you to not believe the gospel. You'll believe Acts 2.38. You'll believe Mark 16. You can come up with all other things to believe, but you will not believe the gospel that was given to Paul by the risen Christ from heaven for your salvation, the gospel of your salvation. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ if you look at Romans 1.16, you'll see what that is to the Jew first and also to the Greek at that time. Who is the image of God shall shine unto them. <clears throat> now, let's go ahead and turn over here so we can get a, a recap of what we left off last week so we can get over to this many. And I'm going to start scratching these off the board tonight, uh, especially these. I'll probably leave this on because uh, this subject that we're in right now, salvation. Uh, while I'm sitting right here, uh, I'm going to another uh, passage at Peter, Second uh, Peter, what he said about Paul and the same thing about salvation. Second Peter 3. Now, you got to understand that Second Peter or anything that Peter wrote is to the little flock of Israel that uh, uh, in the early Acts uh, from all you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, 12, is Peter and the boys going to Israel for the hope of Israel because God gave them one extra year after they crucified their Messiah to pull their head out of the rear end and say, hey, repent and admit that you crucified your Messiah and then the kingdom shall come. But they didn't do that. 2 Peter 3, 15. If I can get out of first Peter. And Peter writes to the little flock an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. It doesn't matter if it's from Adam until the last man on this earth. God's will is that all men be saved, and it's about salvation. Everything you find in this Bible is about salvation, written to someone. We're going to find out. I'm going to try to get this. That's why it's written big right down here about what happened to uh, Abram back in early Genesis right there, what he did to be justified by faith. It's really simple, folks. Believe what God says, when he says it, and to whom he says it. It's that simple. You can't go back in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and find your salvation because he was speaking to the Jews only, the little, the lost house of the house of Israel at that time. So anyway, and salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking of them, what? Salvation in those epistles. Some things hard to be understood, which they, that's anybody that fits in this verse, that are unlearned and unstable, rest as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. So if you're going to write me on uh, the YouTube and you're going to give me all this long list of stuff that's Acts 238 oriented, you fit into that verse right there. You're twisting scripture unto your own destruction. You will die lost in your sins, dead and you will perish. No eternal life for you. You're dead, death, by the original sin that was brought on by Adam. And we're going to try to get into all this tonight. Anyway, back to where we were, 1 Timothy 2. So we can pick up where we were. In verse 4, who? 
God, the Savior, will have all men to be saved. All means all. Now, <clears throat> the Calvinists will sit there and say that because they do not understand predestination that uh, Paul does speak about, they think that only certain people are predestined for salvation. That's how they take that word. But then when you throw the all out there, they start stammering because they can't understand what the word all means. It's a little three-letter word. It's not that difficult to understand. If I have all your money and you have none, I got all your money. It's not tough. All means all. So let's go ahead. While we're, we're going to get these minis knocked out, then we're going to talk about, I have my wife. She does um, over here all the uh, YouTube stuff, all the uh, geek stuff. I can't do that stuff. I can do it if she talks me through it. This board right here uh, come from Larry and his wife, okay? So everybody does a little bit of everything, and that's what the body does. Everybody in the body doesn't do everything, okay? So I'm just, uh, I'm the one that gets the mouthpiece up here, and I get all the uh, bashing from people because uh, they're unstable, and they're, uh, they're twisted into their own destruction. I get to be the person they beat up on. Meanwhile, other people in the background back here and uh, Val's back there laughing. They just sit back and they just get smile and sit there and say, well, Rick's got the big mouth, so he gets to be beat up for that. But that's okay. I have broad shoulders. I can take that. All men to be saved. Now, let's go to turn to Matthew 20. Get back here where Christ sent his uh, 12 apostles out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. No Gentiles, no Samaritans. Matthew 20. And see what Matthew writes right here. Now remember, in this verse right here, God's will is that all men be saved. Verse 2028. And if you'll notice in your Bible, this is in red. That means Christ said these words. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for all. Now, let's go back to 1 Timothy right there and see what uh, Paul says after Christ ascended into heaven and what he says. Now, Christ says a ransom for many right here. Let's see what Paul says over here. 1 Timothy. I don't want people to think I'm pulling a, a rabbit out of the hat like some other preachers around here do. They actually pull a rabbit out of the hat. He's not very far from here. And you got to watch him. Not only will he pull a rabbit out of your hat, he'll pull your checkbook out of your pocket before you even know it. And he's, he'll write the own checks and he'll cash them before you even get done crying. And let's talk about that crying for a minute. I've got some people on here. They don't want to uh, judge someone on because they can't on proper doctrine. They want to go over and blow V8 and mouth about how I present something. And if you want don't like how I present it, I challenge you, start your own Bible study, and I'll see how you challenge it. I'm not going to stand up here in my Sunday finest. I'm not going to have a big black piano like this old boy down Baton Rouge. I'm not going to sit up there and play that piano and sing some hymns for you with big old crocodile tears, and you're coming down there to that altar, and you're begging for forgiveness because that's sat down and tell you you can lose your salvation today if you do the wrong thing. Meanwhile, he's in a high rise over doing hookers himself. Okay, he got kicked out of the church of God church for doing these very things that he tells you not to do. So if you expect come around here expecting I'm going to be crocodile tears and I'll pass this plate, you come to the wrong place because this is not it. This is a no snowflake zone. This is the truth zone. You're a snowflake, move on because we don't want to hear your comments. Move on. There's thousands upon thousands of other places you can go find what you're the itching ears. Uh, the things that you want to hear on YouTube. This is not it. You want Bible truth? We study the Bible here. What do we do? We study the Bible. Why? It's a Bible study. And what do you do at a Bible study? You study Bible. That's what we do here. And if you don't like studying the Bible, move on. It's not going to hurt my feelings. As long as one person finds out, like Harry says, how do I fit in this? If we only get one, that's enough for me. I'm not on YouTube. Uh, to get, I don't know how many likes or whatever you do to make money. I'm not on here for that, okay, folks? We're on here for Bible study. I don't call this anything. It's just a, a, a weekly Bible study. We just had our meal a while ago, and we and now you're sitting out here. This uh, For the last three weeks, it's been a live Bible study with people, with folks here. 
a lot of the other videos I've done, there's no, not been anybody here except the dog. So anyway, First Timothy <clears throat> 2, 6, <clears throat> who, the Christ in verse 5, gave himself a ransom for <clears throat> all. Now, Paul says all. Christ said many. Why is there a change here? Is your Bible lying to you when it says many or all? Because they're not the same word. All is not many, and many is not all. I can have many a car, but I ain't got them all. Okay, now let's go ahead and turn over to, uh, we're not going to go on 34. You can study it out for yourself. Matthew 26, 28. This is a <clears throat> right to end of Christ's life if he has already died. Twenty six, twenty eight. 28. Uh, he's fixing to. That's the night before. Uh, so it's the night of the Passover. And this is uh, Christ's words. For this is my blood of the New Testament. I want to tell you, folks. You are not in the New Testament. This Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I'm going to have to hurt your feelings, is not New Testament. Everything in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is Old Testament. The only thing different is Christ is on the scene now. The New Testament. We're going to read right now. It's in Jeremiah 31, 31, if you want to know what the New Testament is. But we're going to flip over to Hebrews 8 to find out what that New Testament is. Christ said it right here. So we got, we got to talk about it. This is Bible study. What do we do here? We study the Bible. We see what is in this thing. And to see if you fit into this, Hebrews 8. What is that New Testament that he's talking about? Well, a testament is like a will. Do you have a testator? You can't have a testator until after the testament. Okay, you write your will, and that will is not valid until the person that wrote the will is dead. Okay, so until that testator dies, the New Testament cannot go into effect. Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8, oh, let's have a look-see. Hebrews 8, 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Now, you tell me, folks, how in the world are you the house of Israel? The house of Israel is 12 tribes of Israel. If you're telling me you're of the 12 tribes, which one are you? Are you of Judah, Benjamin? I want to know which one. With the house of Israel, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be to me a people. Now, it says it right there, the house of Israel. And you look up in verse 9, it says where he took them out of the land of Egypt. Who is that? The, out of the land of Egypt. They had to cross the Red Sea. Israel. If you just believe what is wrote on these pages, folks, this Bible is not hard to understand. But when you spiritualize everything, so well, I think it means me or that when it says the house of Israel, and Israel has been low am I for 2,000 years. There's no temple there. Look up Hosea 1. You'll find out what low am I means, not my people. They've been that way since they were cast away in Acts 28. You can't be the house of Israel. Come on now, folks. Now, let's go back here to Mark. Let's see what Mark says in comparison to, um, uh, no, we're going to finish, uh, we're going to finish Matthew 26 first. Finish what the Lord said right there. Then we're going to switch over to Mark. We only got to the New Testament. And a lot of this has everything to do with Timothy. You may not think it does, but it does. <clears throat> For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, for the remission of sins. He just sat there and said, for many, remission of sins. And when is that remission going to take place? Then we got to go back to Peter and find out. He tells you exactly when that is. Turn to Acts 3. Acts 3, uh, 19. 
Peter is still uh, speaking to <clears throat> uh, Israel here, trying to get them to repent for crucifying, killing, he says, you killed your Messiah. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now, if Larry is present with me right now, that means he's here. I have his presence. He's not on the east side of Bonterre, and I'm on the west side. I don't have his presence, okay? He is here right now, so he is present. That means when the Lord is present with these people, their sin will be blotted out. That's the remission, okay? That's it. That's how they're not forgiven until the Lord appears the second time for these folks, okay? It's that simple. Remission of sins and forgiveness of sins are totally two different things. Okay, now let's turn to Mark 10, 45. And while we're in Mark, once we get up to 14, we're going to look at uh, for this old boy in Acts 2, 38 and see if this stuff really works. Could I ask everyone that throw Mark out there, does this, uh, can you do these things? Mark 10, 45. <clears throat> For even the Son of Man came not to minister, he ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now we talked uh, in Acts 13 where Paul goes through that. And it's right down here if you want to look for it in Acts 13, who a Savior was sent to. It was sent to Israel. That Savior was sent to Israel. I'll say it again. We've got to repeat, 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 repeat. Israel, not you Gentiles. Mark 14, 24. Let's see what he says back here. <clears throat> and he said unto them, who's the them? The 12 that was sitting there with him that night. The 12 apostles. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, 4, a ransom for all. A shift has happened here. Okay, folks? No longer Jew and Gentile first. Now we're going to, or Jew and Greek, which is a God-fearing Gentile. But now it's going to all. That's how Harry fits in now. It's going to all in this dispensation of the grace of God. So we're going to mark these out, get rid of this and the minis. And we're going to look what uh, Christ right here says. And this is what uh, we're going to start getting into Adam. Uh, here, right here in a few minutes, I got to get into uh, back where I was talking about my wife with uh, uh, being a geek and getting all this YouTube stuff up and Larry and that stuff right here. Uh, there's a fella that helped uh, besides Timotheus, which is Timothy, which we're talking about. <clears throat> His name is uh, Tissicus, okay? And he's not a well-known guy. Okay, you, you hear uh, people like Paul and Timothy, Silas and Barnabas, but Tissachus, he was in the background, okay? He was doing the Lord's work, and you read what uh, Paul says about him. He done mighty things. Uh, he helped Paul in the ministry, and we're going to look at what he did, uh, and then because Timotheus or Timothy ran with him, and they did the ministry together, okay? And Tissachus is how you fit in with, along with the Ephesians and the Colossians. But let's see what Christ says first in John 5.40. And see what the whole purpose of all this whole thing is that we're even sitting up here talking about. God's will is that all men be saved. Uh, these are <clears throat> the words of the Lord while he's walking around those dusty roads uh, in Israel. And 5.40. And he says, and I can guarantee you there's somebody out there listening right now, you're the same way. You wouldn't listen to Christ if he was standing here talking to you. You wouldn't listen to Paul if he was standing here talking to you. You would argue with both of them. You'd say, Peter's right. I got to be repent, be baptized. And you'd crucify. You would crucify either Paul or the Lord himself because you disagree with him. 540. And ye will not come to me. These Jews cry, uh, Christ says in John uh, 1, 
he came into his own and his own received him not. Who's the own? Israel. And he's saying here, ye is Israel, will not come to me that ye may have life. You got two options here, folks. You can have eternal life right here today. Now, if you trust that gospel, or you can take your last breath not knowing and have eternal death. The choice is yours. This stuff is serious, and I'm up here talking. I'm up here to blow you just to have my head spin and hear my mouth talk all the time. So you people on YouTube so sit there and say whatever you want to say, okay? You can go ahead and bring it on, bring it on with your Acts 238 and your bloviating about other <laughs> things. But we're going to get down to what is called Bible study. And that's what Christ says right here, that ye can have life. And we're going to get into life over here uh, because this whole thing wrapped up that Timothy is, uh, is talking about here. You got to remember, Timothy, Paul told Timothy to abide, abide, stay in Ephesus. Ephesus has become, if you will, the new Jerusalem. The Holy Ghost left Jerusalem in Acts 8. It departed. Go back and read it. It left Israel. It left Jerusalem, and it left Israel, okay? <clears throat> and now it's up here around up here where Paul is hanging out in Ephesus. That's where Christ is doing his work. Because salvation is now sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. It's funny that you said uh, with Ephesus, and you have Paul telling Timothy to stay, abide in Ephesus, and this Tisicus fellow comes around and delivers two letters, the Ephesian letter and the Colossian letter, okay? <clears throat> so whole thing here is about salvation, and when, the whole study is for me about Timothy is, when was forgiveness of sins, okay? We're going to get more into that. Because we have to get down to this atonement right here. How are we doing on time, Larry? Oh, did you <laughs> about 30 in? Yep. So we're going to we're going to wrap down here. We're going to start out. <clears throat> we're going to find first out about Tithicus, and then we're going to find out what happened to Abram back here. Okay. And so, folks, this goes back here. You got to understand from Adam to Abram was 2,000 years. God dealing with mankind. There was no law. There were Anything that you could think of was going on back there. You think it's bad today, you, you read that Bible back there and see what was going on back then. It's a little bit more blunt than most people want to talk about today because they don't want no one to step on their toes. They don't want to talk about sodomites. Well, you, only, you can only have a sodomite if you lived in Sodom. The Bible calls them sodomites for a reason. Figure it up. First five letters up there and say it all. So anyway... Where we got that. We got life. We got John. Uh, let's go ahead. Let's start with Tiphicus. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4. <clears throat> and my Timothy is going to be going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But you can't talk about Timothy and things going on in Timothy unless you use the rest of the Bible. Because Timothy's come out in Acts 16, and he's all the way for the next, I'm going to say, roughly 15 years of Paul's life. Uh, so there's a Paul's, half of Paul's ministry was with Timotheus and the other people that was uh, disciples, uh, Paul called them, that was helping Paul in the ministry. It's not by one person. One person can't do all this by himself. They can't do it. And if you think he can, go ahead and try it. 1 Timothy 4, 9. <clears throat> this is a faithful saying and worthy of all exception. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men. If you're sitting out there right now and you are blinded by your God, Satan, because you've not believed the gospel of Christ, no matter what, God is still your Savior. He's still your Savior. He paid a ransom for all. You just got to trust him. especially of those that believe. Verse 11, these things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of believers in word, conversation, and charity, and spirit, and faith, and purity, till I come. Give attendance to reading, exhortation, 
and to doctrine. You don't have to turn there, but when we first started out in, in 1 Timothy 1 3, Paul said that you thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. What doctrine? The doctrine that Paul taught. Paul taught Timothy that everywhere Paul went, that doctrine right there. So if you're in Acts 2 38, Paul didn't teach Acts 2 38. Verse 14, neglect not the gift that is in thee. Now, you have your mid-acts mid that have a problem right here. Because they'll sit there and say, we have no gifts today. Well, they are right in that aspect. The only free gift today is the gift of salvation. <clears throat> but here we are in 1 Timothy, and we're going to look at 2 Timothy also. Timothy still had a gift. Why did he have this gift? Because you had these folks over here that we had this discussion last night at the dinner table. These people over here did not eat pork. They didn't eat lobster. They didn't eat shrimp. Okay. They were saved in the body of Christ, but they're just like a, a good Baptist today. You can take a Baptist today that had been in a Baptist denomination for 35 years. And all of a sudden, he starts seeing the light about certain things, certain truths in the Bible. And then you can call it right dividing if you want. I hate to use that term because they beat that thing to death like a dead horse. But anyway, and then these Baptists, once they start seeing the truths of the Bible, they still have 35 years of Baptists indoctrinated in them. You can never get all that out. And these Jews over here had the same thing. They could be 50, 60, 70 years old and have, since day eight, they've been circumcised. Okay. They've been going to the synagogues. They've been going down to the three feasts if they were devout Jews. In Jerusalem, no matter how far away they lived, all their lives, okay? It's hard to get all this stuff out of here. These barbarians over here, before they were saved, Scythians, I won't say it again, they'd cut the head off these people, bleed them out, scrape the brains out of their, eat their brains, drink their blood out of their skulls. That's just the way they lived. Meat was meat to them. It didn't matter what it was. Meat, meat. Anyway, so... Timothy right here says the gift. And what gift is this? Timothy is staying in Ephesus. Okay? He has to, and we're going to look at it in Ephesians 4 right here. If you want to turn to Ephesians 4, what that gifts are. Timothy, for this one new man that's right here, we have a series on the one new man. You can go back and look at it. This one new man, of these, there's not two bodies right here like Stam said there was. And there's out there people today say, you say there's two bodies. No, there's only one body of Christ. There are two groups in that one body, or there was. You had these people in Paul's Acts ministry, and you had these barbarians, the Gentiles like you and me. So Timothy's job was to bring those, use that gift, bring those people together and say, hey, these people over here don't have to live by those dietary laws, and you can't force them. You people over here, you need to back off a little bit about it. They don't want to drink blood. Don't be drinking blood and from take it home uh, in your closet, whatever you do. Kind of help the old boys out because, you know, they still got that denomination there as a minimum. We need to help them out. So he, his job was that gift to bring these two together. Now, let's look at Ephesians 4. <clears throat> Paul says about these gifts. Ephesians 4 down to... Um, He speaks in verse 8 about he gave gifts unto men. Timothy was one of those men at that time. And he says in verse 11, he gave some, gave his past tense when Paul wrote this letter. Not now. When Paul wrote this letter 2,000 years ago, that was past tense. Excuse me. Apostles, some. Prophets, some. Evangelists, some pastors and teachers for what purpose the next verse says it all larry said this uh just last night to adjust these people perfecting of the saints to bring it make an adjustment with these people in their lives bringing them to these two different groups of people in the body bring them together like this okay for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ because there is something that happened here that had never happened before. One new man. And it's in Ephesians. You just got to go in and read it. We've done a study on the one new man. 
<clears throat> so let's turn to 2 Timothy 1 6. We're getting into Timothy and seeing what's going on with him. And uh, there is so much to cover here. Uh, the study is about Timothy. And that all men be saved. That's the whole theme of Timothy is that all men be saved. Okay. And Timothy was young. So, and Paul was in prison, the second uh, letter. His mentor was now captured. And how can Timothy have uh, be of good cheer when he knows what's fixing to happen? Nero was now the Caesar. He ran the Christians out after the fires of 64. Okay. He wanted them gone because he blamed them for the fires of 64. And he meant business. And he butchered a lot of them. And all you got to do is study your history right there. I'm not going to do that one for you. Uh, 2 Timothy 1 6. For God hath not. Nope, that's seven. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of uh, laying of the hands. <clears throat> Timothy had a gift <clears throat> that was given to him back here. He's first to trust in Christ in Acts 16. Okay, when Paul laid his hands on him, he is then an apostle, and he had these gifts that was in Ephesians 4 over there. But they're no longer given at that time. Paul tells Timothy, stir up those gifts because of one reason. You got a job over here in Ephesus, buddy. And I'm counting on you to do that because my head is going to be whacked off soon. I'm offering myself up for a sacrifice. And that's what he says in Timothy. I'm ready to be offered. Okay. So Timothy's main job is Ephesus or in, you can just say Asia right there because Ephesians, Colossians. And then you had the seven, if you want to go and study that. Uh, the seven churches uh, there in Revelation are in Asia, and Timothy is in charge of those places. He's got to go and teach no other doctrine, like Paul says. Not the doctrine that John was talking about in Revelation. Uh, let's turn to 2 Timothy 4, uh, verse 3 and 4. <clears throat> and this is where we are today, folks. It's no different than uh, it is 2,000 years ago, but it's really rampant today because <laughs> Like I said, we got uh, probably 10 churches uh, right down here, uh, a couple blocks down, and you can't find one of them that teach the same doctor. Now, they do teach one doctor. I can guarantee you they do have one Old Testament doctor. You know what's called? Tithing. They're in business for your money. They're not in business to get your soul saved, folks. They can care less about your soul. Their business is those fancy Cadillacs, putting on the suits, buying the big, and paving those big uh, black parking lots out there. You can't get all that stuff without money, honey. 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the time will come when they, the 10 churches right down here that I'm talking about, they are the day because not one of them speak the same thing that Paul taught, that they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having niche and ears. If you want somebody to cry crocodile tears for you and boohoo and make you get into your emotions and your feels, then you can find those places on every corner, okay? And we're going to talk about what those people are, Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians, what they really are. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. They love those fables. They can get up there and cry and tell you a story. And there's one down in Houston. He'll say, this is my Bible and all the hogwash she says. And if he says one verse and says anything about it, you're lucky right there. Meanwhile... $10 million mansion. Anyway, uh, let's go to verse 12. And we get into this old boy over here called Tithicus. And Tithicus, have I sent to Ephesus. Now, we have Timothy abiding in Ephesus. <clears throat> Paul, in 2 Timothy, this is the last book he wrote. <clears throat> okay. Why is Tithicus going to Ephesus? Well, number one, he's from Ephesus, from Asia, and he has two letters in his hands. One's called the Ephesians, one's called Colossians. He's en route from Rome. That's probably 1,500, 2,000 miles away they had to go back then, unless they went across the sea. So let's say 1,500 miles uh, on an ass or walking with Jesus boots like I got on right here. Okay. They got a long ways to go. He's carrying two letters with him. <clears throat> Antithicus, have I sent unto Ephesus? Now let's go back to let's find uh, Tithicus again uh, in Acts 20. <clears throat> and 
And in verse 3, Paul writes, most likely, uh, uh, the Romans and uh, 2 Corinthians, while he's in uh, uh, Greece for three months. And in verse um, 4, and they're accompanying him to Asia, so Pater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, uh, Aristar, Starkus, and uh, looks like Secundus, whatever that is, and Gaius of Derby, and Timotheus, which is Timothy, uh, and of Asia, Tisiphicus, Tisiphicus, Tithicus, and uh, Trophimus, okay, of Asia, is the old boy that Paul sent to Ephesus. Now, when we get into Acts 18, 19, and 20, these Ephesians that Paul is talking about right here are these Ephesians right here. They were the children of promise. If you look in uh, Acts 8 or 19, you'll find those in the synagogue of Jews when Paul enters into uh, Ephesus right there. He tells you where he finds them at, the synagogue of the Jews. It's not that hard to understand that. He tells you where he finds them. He tells you what he does with them. He yanks them out of there and spends uh, almost two years with them in a school of one Tyrannus. And all of Asia heard, that Asia that you read right there, all Jews and Greeks in Asia, he said, heard the gospel of Christ over here, which is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. <clears throat> Let's turn to Ephesians 6. At the end of the, the letter here, in verse 21, but that ye also may know my affairs. So Paul's in prison right here. And he wants the Ephesians to know uh, what's going on. They just can't pick up a cell phone or do a messenger call because people are spoiled. They don't understand that a letter took a long time and you only had letters, no phone calls, not even Maul Bell back then. If you don't know what Maul Bell is, you're really young. But that you may also know my affairs and how I do. Tithicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known unto you all things. So Tithicus right here is bringing this letter. He's bringing the Colossian letter. And I can guarantee you, Timotheus or Timothy is sitting there waiting for that letter because he's abiding in Ephesus. And Paul is going to give him that final doctrine, except for the doctrine of 2 Timothy. He's already gotten the first letter of Timothy, okay? So he's going to get that final three letters from Paul. And that is going to be the doctrine that he is going to teach, that he's going to bring these two groups together, and which is also your doctrine in the church age, not Acts 2.38. So, okay, folks, now let's get back to the board a little bit. <clears throat> We're going to get back to what to the originator of all of our problem. <clears throat> and I, you can read on Facebook how you are made in the image of God. Boy, Satan has made a mockery and a liar out of you. You want to know why? Only two people were made in the image of God in his likeness. And your name's not Adam, and your name's not Eve. We're going to find out who you're made in the image of. Let's go to Genesis 1. We're going to start back in the beginning of the book back here where all our problems originated. Well, it says, uh, yeah. First Genesis 1 26. <clears throat> and God said. Now, if God said it, you can set your clock by it. He means exactly what he says. Let us, who do you think the us is? Well, there's an us there, but God said, let us. Who's the us? Well, it's got to be a us is more than one. But it says, and God said. So who's the us? Well, you got to have a us to have, you got to have at least two, but I can guarantee you there's three, there's God, and then there's the Son, Jesus Christ, and there's a the third one, the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit hovered on the earth at that time. Read up earlier in chapter one. Let us make man in our image <clears throat> after our likeness. And we're not going to go further in the verse. He's going to have the main and all the fowl and the fishes. And he names all the animals and he does all the good stuff. So if you see a lion out there, Adam named that thing a lion. Okay. 
If you like a perch, he called it a perch before you ever thought about calling it a perch. Now, look, Adam and Eve was made in the image of those three in the Godhead. And the likeness, let's see where you fit in. Genesis 5, Adam's already sinned here. And verse 3, and Adam lived 130 years and begot a son. And he tells you who that son is, Seth. He's number three on this earth. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his own image. Something changed. It's no longer after the image of God and the image of or the likeness of God. Something changed. Adam at this time has been kicked out of the garden. He, there was a cherub blocking the entrance. He can no longer go in because he has one thing. And you, when you're born, you have the same thing. From everybody from Adam until the last man born on earth is going to have that same thing. It's called a sin nature. It's called the Adamic sin nature. Okay. Saint Adam was the first to sin, and that is passed on by every man, every child. I don't care if that baby is one years old, is born a sinner. It has the Adamic nature in it, sin nature, okay? Because I've raised three kids, and as soon as they can start learning how to talk, what's the first thing they do? They start lying. Did you take that cookie out of there? No, I didn't take that. Did you eat that? No, I didn't eat that. Now, did you teach them kids a lie? Where do you think that comes from? Sin nature. Adam, you were made in his image and his likeness because of that one sin. He passed that down to every generation. Now, there's only one way to get out of that. You're always going to have a sin nature in your life. You're, if you're trusted that gospel, now you're going to have two natures. Because don't sit there and give me that hogwash. You're going to stop sinning. Because you just, as soon as you got popped out of your mouth, you just, you just sinned. You lied. As soon as you said, I'm going to stop sinning, you lied. That's number one. <clears throat> in Romans 1, 25, I believe, it says, understanding if you don't understand what god says 5 we got 5 yeah. we got 10 minutes if you don't understand what god is saying that's a sin everybody sins there's none good no not one so if a baby comes out born there is none good no not one that baby is no good in the flesh and the only way that you can get out of this right here and get into this life right here is have the imputed righteousness of Christ imputed to you. It's not on the board right here. We're going to get into Romans 8, looks like next week, because I took the long way around to get there. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> Remember, we are made in the image of Adam, the likeness of Adam. That means we have that sin nature. You cannot get rid of that thing. You have one sin that will send you that is plaguing you all your life, okay? And that is death. You will die. When he said, you will surely die, did Adam die the day he said, no. He didn't die that day. So you would think that uh, that would be the death, but that's not the death that he's talking about. He did die. All flesh dies. <clears throat> Christ, I want to say God, loved you so much that he let his own son die for your sins, for your forgiveness of sins at the cross. That's how much he loved you. God loved you that much. He let his own son, the one of the us's in there in Genesis 1, die for you. He became your sin. Second Corinthians 5. And then we'll wrap this thing up for tonight. Second Corinthians 5. <clears throat> and he will have a problem with one word right here, and I don't understand why, because we're, I have to get into uh, a Romans 3 for a second, but uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.19, Paul writes, to wit, that God was in Christ. When was that? When he was on the cross reconciling the world unto himself now people will sit there and say well that is not the world and now they can come up with so many excuses that it's not even funny the world began back there when they, he made that one man back there 
okay? Christ's death on that cross went, reached all the way back here for this remission of these people's sins back here, okay? Come, he reached, that's how powerful that was. God dying for you to be able to save this man back here, uh, the originator of sin, okay? 519, reconciling the world. Now, if you have a spouse, uh, it's a guarantee you're going to need some reconciling because it's just a guarantee. And that means it takes two to reconcile. You can't have one doing all the reconciling and saying, I'm doing this for you, and the other one sitting back on the couch, flipping through the TV channels and ignoring everything. It takes two to tangle. It takes two to reconcile, okay? Not, and he said the world here, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and God hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now look down there in verse 21. For he, God, hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin. Christ knew no sin. The sins of the world was placed, the world up here in 19, was placed on Christ. Every freaking sin in the world was placed on that man. God turned his back on him. It dark. Okay? It was darkness upon the earth. The wickedness that was placed on Christ that day. You can't even imagine what wickedness was placed on Christ. Just look in your own closet and you can just sit there and multiply that by billions of people, okay? You're not goody two shoes. You're there is none good, no, not one. You're just as rotten as anybody else. And that was placed on Christ that day, okay? That we might now, might doesn't mean might is like may receive righteousness or may receive forgiveness of sins. You might receive it and you might not. Okay. The righteousness of God in him. The only way that you can get out of this death, your physical body is going to die no matter what. And you can have the second death if you want to, but you're not going to like that second death because that is at the white throne judgment. Okay. And Paul says in Romans 2 16, every little secret that you have, every little secret that you're hiding in your little crooked nannies of your nasty rotten flesh will be judged according to Paul's gospel. So it's not that hard, people. God's will is that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Believe Paul's gospel, okay? Trust that Christ, every sin was placed on him. You don't have to do anything. It's not about you anyway. God forgave Christ for you. God doesn't care that it's about you. It was about forgiving Christ because in that when he died, he took on your sins, okay? He became sin for you. God forgave Christ so he could raise him from the dead, which had your sins on him, or he could not have raised him from the dead, okay? He's seated in heavenly places right now. No, no unrighteousness. If you want what Christ has, trust the gospel, and you get imputed life. You get the righteousness of Christ. It's, you get justified, just as if you never sinned. Justified means declared innocent. You can be forgiven and still be guilty as hell, as I've said, but you're not declared innocent. Only by trusting what Christ did can you be declared innocent. And the mud clears when you're running to buy the word of truth. Amen. Was it?